how do you humanize a monster, a villain? Let's talk about Pharma Bro. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Trap Podcast. I am Chris Gore. As you know, I'm a big fan of documentaries, documentaries of all types. I love music documentaries, documentaries about social issues, uh, documentaries about pop culture issues. This is this is a documentary, Pharma Bro, that combines, uh, it, I would put it in the category of a pop culture documentary, uh, but also it, 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 it looks at the social issues and, and medical issues of our age. You probably know who Martin Shkreli is. He is the guy that took this orphan drug that he somehow got the rights to and raised the price from $15 to $750 a pill. The documentary Pharma Bro takes a look at Martin Shkreli, his journey, who he is. And this guy, it's, I mean, first of all, he was called the most hated man in America, probably the world. And I have the director here, Brent Hodge, uh, Brent Hodges, uh, great to talk to you. Wait, it's Brent Hodges. Did I misspell that? I no, can't... Brent Hodges, Hodge. You can call me what Hodge. Everyone calls me Hodgey, whatever you want. Okay, cool. Brent Hodge. Uh, welcome to the Film Trap Podcast. This documentary, what I love is, uh, before we even get to Martin Shkreli in your doc, you open with a, a brief interview with Dr. Travis Langley, uh, a friend of mine. I've been on panels. I, I, wrote, uh, I wrote the foreword to one of his books on the psychology of Star Trek. And Travis is fantastic at really breaking things down. You're at a comic book shop talking about villains like the Joker and comparing Martin to what makes a great villain. I thought that was such a great way to enter this topic. Tell us about um, how you, I mean, you talk about it in the movie, but briefly for this interview, tell us like how you got to know Martin, how you got to, in a way, gain his trust and and do the impossible, which is you take a person that's been vilified in the media, who's a monster. There's everyone knows who he is because he's a horrible person from what they've been told. And you give a glimpse that maybe there is some humanity there. So tell me about the, the process of getting started making this. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was really the process like everybody else was probably going through, which was headlines of a guy. CEO of pharma company, dude is an AIDS killer buying the Wu-Tang album. And I was like, this is really weird and interesting. And he's the most hated man in America. But the problem was with all these headlines is I wasn't getting what I necessarily wanted from the articles. It wasn't giving me any attention. Like I would go through and go, why has nobody talked to a Daraprim patient? Like someone that's toxoplasmosis, Wu-Tang, why isn't anybody talking to Wu-Tang? Like I'm sure Ghostface would talk about this. Uh, you know, the trial, we barely hear from, from Screlly's lawyer. And, and then, you know, as I started going down the wormhole, you, in, if you, if you, in 2015, if you kind of go through and, and look up Martin, you will actually arrive at his live stream. And he was live streaming his whole life. And I thought it was phenomenal that there was all these articles about a guy, third person talking about him, but no one was actually talking to him. And I just started going on these chats and asking him questions just out of curiosity. He would give you his phone number and you would call. Um, and he would just, that was it. And it was this, this phenomenal way of making a movie. We started recording those and I got everything I wanted uh, by just starting there and doing that. And then we just started going further. He's like, come find me. Here's where I live. This is my house. And we move into the apartment building and we get deeper. I go back to Skrell, Albania. I find out where his family's from. We interview Wu Tang. We interview like we just wanted all of it, and I wasn't getting that from the articles originally that were coming out. Well, it's interesting because if you're going to base a whole movie around a person and their life, you have a set list of questions you want to ask. And what's interesting is you got to ask him all of those questions. They all eventually come out. You had these. It's and and this is this has been a trend now in documentaries. It's not new, but you included, you are in the documentary. Um, you, you're not necessarily the subject, but but you're the gateway to to Martin. And you had all these in your place, these boards yeah. with all the, that was all real. That was not for show. This was just like, you're trying to put all this together. It's a great way. It's almost like a, what do they call that? A vision board, right? Yes. Like yeah. it was a way to kind of like manifest the film in, in, right in front of you. Tell me about like putting those boards together and even coming up with all the questions that you wanted to ask, which I'm sure you didn't include all of them in the doc. 
No, I mean, there were so many. We have 500 plus hours of this guy recorded. Like it was, it was wild amount of live streams that we had. And he would do it all night, every night. But I, I think, you know, you sort of nailed it at the start of like, if you want to look at a super villain in comic books and how we've been sort of relating to them is like, they're pretty one dimensional. It's all evil. The like infuriating complexities of Martin Shkreli were not getting developed. And you have to go really sort of deeper to find that humanity if there is any. Um, and I, I love that quest. I mean, I just love sort of the, these oddball documentaries that come out. Um, like you said, you watch music docs and pop culture docs and everything. I think there's so many different categories of docs now. This one fit in this weird world with Blumhouse where you're like, is it a horror doc? Is this so real that it's so scary, but also kind of funny? And like, what what is going on? This isn't a murder doc. This is like a horror doc. And I don't think I've ever seen one until Blumhouse did the jinx. And I was like, which also kind of includes some murder. So you're like, this is like its own weird world. And I loved that. Um, but that was it. We just wanted to go deeper and deeper and do something different. And, and, and like Roger and me does it. It's one of my favorite yeah. films. Um, you know, Michael Moore does this from the beginning. He's like, let's, let's go, let, let's go on a quest to find Roger. Um, I find the jinx. I think like, you know, Jesus camp, Heidi, Heidi and uh, Rachel did Jesus camp is like exit through the gift shop. These are like, films that I have that inspired me and I've thought about a lot and I was on a quest to kind of to like play in that universe and make a film that's just odd and, and weird and who who isn't more perfect subject than Martin Scully for that well it's it's interesting because obviously I before watching your documentary all I knew about him was what I'd seen in the media and he'd become even like when I mean, you put it in the doc there's like he's a joke on late night tv I mean he's been you know he's this, I mean, he's an easy punchline, right? Uh, what do you know about him? He's a monster. And I I do think that there is, like, it's so hard to do that. I mean, we've seen in some, even the like the, the Marvel movies, and I, I love that your gateway is comic books, right? It's like a comic book villain. They're one-dimensional. But, you know, uh, like Killmonger in Black Panther is an interesting villain because you go, oh, well, he kind of has some points, yes. right? Like, he actually has some points, and I would argue that he's probably more interesting than than Black Panther, the title character. But what were some of the like? You made this movie over what, like five or six years? Five what years. are some of the challenges? I mean, it, I mean, I mean, just even like having a living, I, because I'm sure you weren't only working on the dock, right? Like just surviving during that time and being able to get all the stuff you mentioned, 500 hours of footage. Um, tell me about some of the challenges in in, in putting this together. Well, I'll say this, like documentaries can sometimes look like one person is on a journey doing it. You look at Michael Moore or Anthony Bourdain or different people. There's a whole team of people helping. There's like a full village. And I can't take credit to say that I, I was the only person sitting in that room, scratching my head, adding to the board, recording every live stream. Um, you know, we had like editors doing shifts and, and a whole team behind this thing, which, which made it possible. Um, but like, I think the difference between this one and, and some docs you might see is, you know, a biopic on TV or some of these are kind of scripted out a little more where you, you know, your shoot days, there's call sheets and budgets and stuff. This is a completely different movie. I didn't know what was going to happen next. I had absolutely no idea, which is in a lot of ways, chaotic and, and also extremely freeing. Like this is a true documentary. We were walking through and had no idea. I had no idea what was going to happen to Martin Screlly. No idea he was going to go to jail for Hillary Clinton's hair request like you don't know these things so you're making this as you go but also you may have just spent the last evening on his live stream and got nothing and also like, trying to make sense of if there should be something there so that was a process and that took a while all i knew is i needed a certain amount of people because that's just not what i was getting in the media there was some like lazy journalism happening um why is no one talking to wu-tang i, I will not stop until i talk to wu-tang like that was the, I sort of had these goals and these elements. Why has nobody talked to a Daraprim patient? Can we find one? And, and it took a long time. I can see why no one was talking to them because no Daraprim patients wanted to come on camera. So that sort of, that sort of helped fuel why and where this thing was heading. Well, it, it's, I mean, you mentioned lazy journalism as if it, that's not happening today on so many levels. That would be a whole separate conversation. I think lazy journalism is the kind that is kind of taken over, but you went so many layers deeper with, with this doc. And that's, an, 
particular uh, a touching moment when you talk to one of the patients who had a, a conversation. I think it was over, might have been over Reddit. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that that moment was, oh, my God, just blew my mind. It just you went all the places that the media chose not to go. They they went the simple route was this guy is a monster. And, you know, you could walk away looking at your documentary and maybe maybe thinking that. But the other thing you included and I don't want to ruin too much of it, but um, I think people do all know what happened to him, you know his ultimate fate, but he also found love. Yeah. And you even interviewed one of, uh, someone who went on a date with him who, who kind of liked him. Uh, yeah. What, so tell me about like, you know, you're talking to women who have been involved with him. Um, how is that? That is crazy. Just the approaches I think is, is, is uh, was, was really uh, creative. Well, there's sort of three parts to that. So I was like, there's got to be a look at the pie, the pie diagram. We're going to talk about the drugs a little bit. We're going to talk, um, you know, about Wu-Tang. We're going to talk about his past. Like, we got to include some part of, of, like, his relationship life, at least at least from what I can gather. Um, went, you know, went with a girl who went on a Tinder date with him. Kind of more of a funny story about him ordering, like, a $200 tea. It, it, very funny. And then a, a girl who like really, really liked him and, and had like sweet time with him. But then the flip side is like, well, what about the women he harassed online? Like the journalists that he bought their domain names. And like there's some sort of odd elements to that sort of relationship with women that he had. Um, the one that hits obviously is Chrissy Smythe who came out publicly last year about uh, falling in love with him. Like a journalist from Bloomberg, everybody knows this, um, fully fell in love with him as he's in jail. That was a crazy interview because that was like four years ago. We did that way before they were ever in a relationship or, or, or at least that I know of. Um, she said to me uh, on camera, they weren't, but I, we were starting to get like, I couldn't believe that her, her sort of like um, sort of like infatuation with him. And she knew so much about him. She knew his parents. I was like, you're, this is an, a very different journalist right here. Um, so we, you know, when that news came out last year, we had to sort of recut the ending of the film and, and make sure we include that. But we already had the interview. Um, so it's, it's weird going back into raw footage and seeing like, oh, you know, maybe she really liked him a lot. Like you can kind of see it in these parts. Uh, I remember going to the trial and I remember looking to the left and it's where like all the journalists and everyone was sitting and looking over to the right. And it was family members and different people. And she was sitting with, with Martin's family. And I was like, oh, this is something, what's going on? Like I, she had a different relationship. Uh, but yeah, the, the women part's funny. I wanted to get all of that in, you know? I wish I could have got some of his family members in the film, too. I, I think the thing that will be very interesting is to see how people respond to this movie. Yeah. My response was to, I mean, first of all, it's um, oddly, wildly entertaining documentary. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just super, super entertaining because this is a topic that, yeah, I, I know the Cliff Notes version of him. He's a horrible monster and did himself no favors by, you know, having even just certain types of facial expressions is sort of like trolling online um, and becoming, you know, the butt of late night humor. But you added these deeper layers. I'm curious now that people have seen the movie, have, has it changed their minds about, about Martin? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it even changed my mind about Martin. I think that's what the an amazing part about an experiment, an experimental film is, is maybe we don't even have to. I, I really did go in with a lot of just observation. Um, if they aren't, if they aren't changed, they're at least more knowledgeable. Like Martin's really is an asshole. I mean, he could probably agree that he's an asshole. And I think being an asshole probably got him put in jail. Um, he didn't do anything illegal when it comes to, uh, drug pricing. So, so what is it? Um, but like, ultimately I know more at least now about why I think he's an asshole, uh, than I did before, but I think you just said the right thing. And that's, that's ultimately what it is for me is, is this entertaining? Cause we're making entertainment and I, I find this film so entertaining. And, and that's when I knew the button, like I could put a button on this and it was done is like, I, I can't wait to watch this movie. It's so weird. and such a weird wrinkle of pop culture. How does this exist? You could not write this. You couldn't write this film. Like, 
a hedge fund whiz kid CEO buys Wu Tang album while raising the price of a rare drug. Like, and then I follow him as I try to find more info on like, it's, it's so odd. And I love that. Uh, so, so I do, I think it's entertaining. I, I think, I mean, the reaction so far has been incredible to the film. Well, I, I will say, I think that's, to me, always the number one most important thing. I mean, you can you can bottle a message in it, which is fine. If you don't hit me over the head with it, I will love it. Is there something to talk about after? Yeah, but as, as soon as I was done watching it, I wanted to watch it again. I don't have that kind of experience with a lot of a lot of movies all the time. That's that's more rare. But this doc like just blew my mind, and uh, I, I really I really hope people take the time to check it out because it's so it's 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 so uniquely told even, right? Like by including yourself and his live streams and just this whole, like I said um, before, when, when I, I was like eight minutes into the movie and I had to look, I had to like pause it and go, that is more information in the first eight minutes than I get in an entire 90 minute documentary in eight minutes, right? Like it just, it just, it was just like so fast paced and so like the way it, told everything in such an economical way, I think was was critical. So kudos to you for that. Um I oh, want really everyone to check that. it out. This is this is me now talking to the audience. Buy or rent this movie, Pharma Bro. It'll blow your mind. Um whether you care how whether you care a lot about the topic or not, it's it, you are you are gonna love this film. And Brent, what 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 else can you tell uh the film threat audience watching or listening to this about the movie? Before um, I let you go. Well, I think like ultimately, you know, you always try to have an experience or what you learn from a film. And all I learned is like through the story of Martin Screlly, like their prime is still $750 and that needs to change. Like yeah. how is this pill through all of this? I can make a movie from all of this and there still isn't even a change in price. Still six years later when he, you know, exactly six years, by the way, in uh, September 20th, 2015, he said, uh, he said publicly, we've raised the price 5,000% 5, 5, on to $750 a pill, and it's still the same. So like, I don't know what you learn from this experience, but uh, the, 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 like, it, it, sure, it's entertaining, and that's great, but something needs to happen with drug pricing in America. Well, um, it's an important message woven into an incredibly entertaining movie. And I will say this, uh, one of the best docs I've seen this year period, bar none. So uh, Brent, thank you so much for joining us on the Film Threat Podcast. And the movie is coming to theaters and it's also gonna, it's video on demand. Is there a date for that yet? Yeah, it's all October 5th. Uh, it's, you know, Blumhouse and 1091 are putting this out and there. It's like, Google this movie, you'll find a place to, to watch this thing. They're so, so good at putting these movies out. So I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed. Awesome. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for joining me on the Film Threat Podcast. Cool, thanks.